Hello and welcome to the first webinar for the annual Temperate Pasture Webinar Series. Today, we we'll have a chat about making pastures we're sowing new pastures. My name's Wendy Gill and I'm the farming officer based at Forbes and it's my pleasure to be your facilitator today. This webinar series is being brought to you as part of the Central West Ag Services ADAPT project. This project is supported through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Let's review using the webinar platform. On the right hand side of all participants screen, you should see this control panel. You can use the orange button to expand and collapse the panel as we move through the presentation. If you need any assistance for log on or audio issues during the presentation, please contact the number situated at the bottom of the screen. Today, all participants will be visited and this webinar is being recorded. A special note to all audiences today. Both Belinda and myself are not using our webcams. This is to improve your audience audio quality in today's presentation. Feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar. You can do this by using the question text box down the bottom of your control panel. And I do thank all participants for sending in any of the early questions at registration. We had some really good questions and it's great to see this feedback. I'd now like to start today with two poll questions for the audience to come in and engage with us nice and early. So I'm going to pop them up now. I'll just launch that for you now. If everybody can please click on the best answer that represents your situation for today. So the poll is open. We've got a nice lot coming in, so that's great. We'll give this a little bit longer. So five more questions, five more seconds, sorry. We'll go five, four, three, two, one. We'll close the poll. And I'll share the results there. So that's great. We look like we've got 100% of our viewers, uh, owner producers that are engaging with us today. That's wonderful and very pleased to have you with us today. We'll now go to our second poll question for today. I'll just launch that now. So that's open. So for our audience, again, clicking on the most representative answer for your type of operation. Again, I'll give that a little bit longer couple more seconds. Really good level of uh, engagement and uptake on this question, so that's great. I'll just start five, four, three, two, one, and I'll close that poll and share those results with you. Okay, so it looks like we've got a bit of a mix. So both our full mixed farming enterprise are part of our audience today and also our livestock and pasture enterprises. So some really good information from, uh, from those polls and something that I know both our guest presenter and I will, uh, will definitely value in today's webinar. So thank you very much for participating in that poll. I'd now like to warmly welcome our guest presenter today. Dr. Belinda Hackney is joining us for today's webinar. Dr. Belinda Hackney is a research officer with the Soils Unit for New South Wales Primary Industries. Belinda has greater than 20 years experience in research, focusing on pastures, soils, and the integration of pastures into cropping systems. She has worked with producers across the central west of New South Wales, also in southern regions of New South Wales, 
and in many national research projects. Belinda is a specialist in hard seeded annual legume pastures and she has an extensive portfolio of pasture research, some of which I've highlighted on your screen today. In our post pre-discussions uh, pre before this webinar, Belinda actually said to me that one of the most enjoyable components of doing pasture research is actually the engagement and the opportunity to learn from growers. So I look forward to really engaging and learning from Belinda's pre presentation today. And I'm absolutely delighted to have Belinda with me today. So I'll just hand over to Belinda and she can start her presentation as well. And I welcome Belinda and thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yes, hopefully it all runs smoothly enough. Um, my computer's just having a little think about uh, taking this up to proper screen size. So just give it a minute. Yes, it's really having a big think today. It has got a, a nice, uh, there we go. That's coming there through in full capacity now. Thanks, Belinda. No worries. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, so um, today I just wanted to have a bit of a talk around pasture renovation because it's something that some of you may be um, looking at or contemplating for the year. Uh, and I just sort of thought it's a, a, a timely um, timely thing to, to have a look at. And then in the next... In the next webinar, we'll have a look at um, manipulation of pastures that you may already have, because they're really the two, I guess the two things that you um, are most often thinking about when it comes to pastures is, um, you know, whether you can squeeze a bit more out of them without having to renovate, or if they're um, kind of past their use by date, if you're, you're having to look at replacing them and, um, yeah, the decision between the two of them. So. Yeah, so today is more about the renovation side of things. And again, regardless of, of whether it's a, a renovation or a manipulation, um, the kind of questions that you need to ask and the, and the choices you have to make can really boil down to a couple of things. So you really need to look at what you have in terms of what limitations there are in specific paddocks or what limitations there are with climate. Um, and any capacity that you have to change them. And then also prioritising the paddocks that you um, select to, to do the renovation work in. And then it's about choosing tactics. So um, how do you alter what's already there? Um, if, and next week we'll, or the week after next will be more about changing what you already have. So that's the, um, you know, that's kind of the, the two key principles, I guess, to keep in mind as we work through this. So um, on the renovation side of things, um, it's really, really it's what today is about is, is just going through some things that may help um, develop some some good choices so that you have more options once you get that pasture up and away in terms of how you manipulate that and how you prolong the life of it. So there, some of those little dot points under there um, are some of the things that we'll work through. Um, there's also a few random things that I'll put in there as we go along. Um, but yeah, we'll just work our way through those and um, yeah, hopefully have plenty of time for questions at the end. So I guess the biggest thing um, to think about in terms of um, renovating pastures uh, is the weed seed bank. And that's usually where, um, if pasture sowings fail, that's the principal reason, you know, behind uh, the largest proportion of the failures that you see. So it's really about understanding what kind of weed problems you might be facing um, and how long it, it takes to deplete that weed seed bank to a point where um, you have the capacity to um, have a pasture established successfully uh, or you have options to um, selectively remove those pastures. So if we start with some of the um, typical annual grass weeds um, that you'd be used to working with, so rye grasses, barley grass, uh, vulpia and, and wild oats. They're all species that tend to have um, quite a short duration in the seed bank um, and particularly uh, barley grass um, and vulpia. Uh, you know, basically they're, they're, they, they have very little dormancy um, and most of those will germinate in the year following 
following the production of that seed. So they don't hang around that long. Wild oats um, is a little bit more persistent in the seed bank uh, and annual ryegrass can be highly variable because it's predominantly an outcrosser, which means that survivors in annual ryegrass um, basically yeah, are very capable at, at um, sharing their genes around and mutating quite quickly and adapting to change. So uh, there's quite a lot of variation in how ryegrasses behave, but I think from the data um, from those publications that are shown on the screen now, you can see that by the time you get to two years, you're generally at less than 10% of the viable seed that you started with in a seed bank if you've had absolute weed control. Uh, and by the time you get to three years, there's very little seed left. Now, percentages are all very well, but you have to be to some extent aware of what kind of numbers you're starting with. So 10% of 3,000 is a bit different to 10% of 300. So um, yeah, they, they do deplete quite quickly, generally most of these annual grasses. So I'm not sure in terms of, um, you know, the kind of spread that we have in the audience in terms of geographic location, but some of the perennial grass weeds um, are a bit of a different story in that they, they have longer persistence in the seed bank. So things like Chilean needlegrass um, and serrated tussock in particular um, do take longer to deplete in the soil. Uh, and they're also um, uh, particularly serrated tussock and lovegrass can be an issue in terms of, of movement with wind. So if you're more to the east, um, then they might be things that you need to consider too in terms of how long you have to have a good cleanup phase before you go into sow a new pasture. If we get to broad leaves, um, I've just chosen one here, which is fairly universal across most areas, and that's cape weed. Um, it can behave quite differently. So the solid green line is uh, cape weed populations that come from um, higher rainfall areas. And the dotted line is um, the cape weed populations in, in lower rainfall areas. And you can see there that uh, the ones that the, the populations from higher rainfall areas tend to deplete more quickly in, in the seed bank, whereas those in lower rainfall areas hang around for, or have the capacity to hang around for longer. And part of that is just adaptation to climate and capacity to go into secondary dormancy and those sorts of things um, if moisture conditions aren't conducive to germination um, of that weed. So that's just one of them. Um, you start to you know, have other things like wild radish and things like that, which also can be quite persistent. But again, generally for most of the weeds that you deal with, two to three years, you'll have those down to quite low levels in the seed bank. So in terms of other things that can impact how quickly that seed bank runs down, um, so seed burial um, can be a way to, I guess, to some extent hide the problem if you've got full soil inversion. And that might be a, a strategy that can work reasonably well if the seeds are small um, and are not capable at, of germination from depth um, and providing there's no future disturbance that re-inverts the soil um, and bring those seeds up again because burial tends to prolong the life of some of the seeds and particularly those ones that have good capacity for dormancy or high hard seed levels. Rainfall, generally, um, higher rainfall areas will accelerate breakdown of seeds, so more of them will germinate more quickly, um, which is good in some ways because at least you get to have a crack at them in terms of um, controlling them. Uh, and it can also help with rotting of some, um, some of the, the weed seeds as well. So temperatures, um, fluctuating temperatures tend to facilitate breakdown of seed. Um, but if you get very hot or very cold temperatures, um, that can also reduce germination or increase the time for emergence of those plants. So um, that's just something to think about with weeds. If you have cultivation without, in, without inversion of the soil, then that will usually, like a bit of a tickle before they're sown, um, that'll usually promote germination. It can be quite a good strategy um, just to get more of those weed seeds up uh, and be able to deal with them before you go in and sow. So in terms of how much seed um, may be around in a, in a paddock that you're considering renovating, um, this was some work done by Annabelle Boucher almost 20 years ago now, so we're all a bit longer in the tooth. Um, 
And this was just a very typical pasture at Wagga, um, a, an old phalaris pasture where the phalaris had thinned out quite a bit. Uh, and Annabelle did some really nice work looking at um, what was in the seed bank. So where, and she had a couple of different strategies in terms of looking at cleaning those um, paddocks up. So it was just a, the normal kind of, or, you know, I suppose letting the paddock run along as it had been, looking at what kind of weed seed levels were there if the paddock was just grazed. And then she put um, also some treatments in where there were um, some, a, a couple of years of, of cutting for hay in winter, or cutting for hay in spring, sorry. So you can see there with the continuous grazing, if you just look at the annual grasses and the broadleaf weeds combined in a pasture as it's just sitting there in the paddock and you're considering renovation, you're looking at somewhere close to about 7,000 seeds per square metre, um, just with the annual grasses and the broadleaf weeds. Where she um, implemented a spring hay cut, that brought it down to about 1,000 seeds per square metre after two years. So that was something that had quite an impact on bringing um, that down. And had there been an additional treatment um, to control any regrowth post cutting, then that probably would have reduced that further. But just bearing in mind, under that continuous grazing, that's the kind of, you know, not atypical um, weed seed populations that you might expect to see. So this comes into play in terms of managing that rundown um, and then also thinking about once you've done that clean up phase, what sort of seeding rates do you need to go to to optimise success of that pasture? And the thing to remember with cleanups is if you're going into a pasture that has a perennial grass component in it, um, you have no herbicide options to remove annual grass weeds from perennial grasses in the year of establishment. If you're talking about legumes um, and to some extent, if it was chicories or plantains and that sort of thing, you really need to get those broad leaves under control ahead of sowing so that you at least hopefully um, are able to utilise softer selective broadleaf weed options um, to control any weeds that do emerge. So really getting um, your ducks in a row before you start is the key thing around weeds. So presuming you've done uh, a nice job on cleanup, um, then it comes down to, well, what are you actually going to grow in the paddock? And I think one of the things that, um, you know, have seen a bit over the years is often there's a bit of a, compl a conflict between what people want to grow compared to what they should grow. And what I mean by that is um, often there's, there can be not enough consideration of limitations that the paddock has or, or the climate um, in the particular region that you're in and capacity to manipulate those. So you've really got to have a think about what the soil physical and chemical conditions are. Um, you know, physical conditions like depth and water holding capacity and those sorts of things are almost innate to the soil. You, you can do some things to help with um, improving water holding capacity, but really when you're talking about depth and texture and those kind of things, they're very much fixed. So you need to work within your boundaries there. And in terms of chemical conditions, things like um, your soil pH and pH at depth, um, phosphorus levels, sulfur levels, those sorts of things are all critical in um, the kind of decisions that you make about what kind of pastures you're going to grow. So, you know, um, surface pH issues are something that you can manage um, when it gets deeper into the profile. Um, you know, you may have to, this is where you start to think about that trade-off between um, amelioration versus choosing species or cultivars within species for tolerance for um, particular limitations that you might have. And then if you're in variable landscapes and aspect and slope and the impact that microclimates are different in temperature and those sorts of things um, may have on, you know, long-term persistence prospects. Because if you've got half a degree difference, um, between aspects and you start to work out the day degree differences. Um, so, you know, how much heat exposure that you get uh, on different aspects that can have a big impact on capacity of plants to survive in the long term. So um, just drilling down a bit further, so starting to think about 
um, legume selection in pasture mixes. Um, one of the key things is hard seed content. So the higher the hard seed content, um, generally the greater persistence that you'll get with uh, species. So I think one of the things here that uh, come across over the years is you need to be careful in making comparisons across species because you may see that um, something is classified as being hard seeded and then another, another species is also classified as hard seeded. But when you actually look at how hard seeded they are, they differ quite a bit. So an example of that would be most of the subclovers that you work with have less than 30% hard seed. Um, whereas something like Bicerula can have somewhere between 70 and 90% hard seed. So both classify as hard seeded, but when you look at the absolute hard seededness, there's a big difference and that has a huge impact on how long those plants can persist in, um, in your pastures in terms of contributing to the seed bank and be capable of regeneration. The other thing too to think about is hard seededness only comes into play after you've had the first year of seed set. So in most cases, when you're buying um, legume seed, it's been scarified. So that hard seed coat um, has been um, uh, altered physically to allow moisture to get in. So um, basically that means you're gonna get a big germination in the first year. Now, once it's produced its seed, then you've got hard seed to play with, but you don't, in that establishment year. So you've got to get as much of, or as many of those plants through to seed production as you can. And things like sowing time and those sorts of things all come into the relative success of that. Another thing to think about too is maturity time. And that in most cases refers um, to the time from sowing until you see flowering. And that's kind of, that's how maturity time is reported. So generally you choose shorter season um, varieties for harsher or more variable climates because they're going to be capable of getting um, seed set prior to um, you know, the onset of late spring or spring moisture stress uh, and those sorts of things. Just had a little caution there. Uh, when I used to do quite a bit of work in the tablelands, um, there was a bit of a tendency sometimes with subclover selections for people to choose extremely early varieties to try and get around that. And what you need to be aware of, it's not exclusive to subclover, it can occur with other things too, is generally when you've had um, varieties selected um, for, or, or they've come, they, they, their um, parent breeding lines have come from very low rainfall areas, they often, um, quite naive in terms of the root diseases that you can get in higher rainfall areas. So just do be careful of that to some extent. Don't go too early if you're in a high rainfall area because you tend to have a higher um, potential disease load um, that those plants may face. Now in terms of maturity time too, we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go through. Um, you now have options like Cerradella and Bicerula, which while they'll have a reported maturity time in terms of days to flower, from sowing, they're indeterminate and that means that they will continue to flower and set seed while ever there's moisture available. So things like your subclovers um, and those sorts of things tend to have a very well-defined um, period of growth and then reproductive development uh, and when, you know, when seed is produced. Whereas Cerradella and Bicerula, that can be a very long window and very adaptable depending on the kind of climatic conditions that you're getting in any particular year. So that's just something to think about. Okay, so um, in terms of maturity times, just have a bit closer look at that. It's a little bit like the hard seededness. So the definition of early or late maturity, again, there can be some um, confusion often when you're making comparison between species. So for example, in subclovers, the difference between a mid-season and a late-season variety of subclover might be as little as 10 days. Now, if you have something then and you're looking at uh, an early maturing subclover, something like a Dalkeith or something like that, and then you look at an arrowleaf clover and it's also defined as early maturing, so something like Cephalu, um, then you might think that you're comparing apples and apples, but to some extent you're not because Cephalu is... Uh, 
about a month later in terms of its days to flower than some of the early varieties of subclover. So just be careful there. And then you get Zulu, which is a mid-season variety, which is one month later than Cephalu, which makes it a whole lot later than a mid-season subclover. So just be careful of those sorts of things. And again, with the Cerradellas and Vicerulas, it's kind of indicative of when they can start reproductive growth, but it doesn't define how long that reproductive growth goes for, which is a very different thing for Cerradella and Vicerula. So just um, make sure you actually um, got a good idea of, of what that maturity time is rather than just categorising them as early or late based on information that you might see. Actually drill down a bit further uh, and get, get a good handle on what that actual time is in terms of days. So I'm not going to go through that table. Um, the, the, I'm assuming this is available afterwards. So that's just a bit of a guide on some of those characteristics and adaptation uh, kind of things that you might want to look at. So things like, you know, the pH um, for the host plant, the pH for the rhizobium. We'll have a little bit closer look at that uh, again later. And then things like, you know, water logging tolerance. If you've got um, intermittent water logging that you might get in winter that might change your choice and then the hard seed thing and the maturity thing and that kind of thing so you can work through that later and have a look at that in terms of comparison. So moving on to lucens um, so uh, uh, I guess a lot of the selection around lucens will come down to considerations around dormancy. Now generally most of the um, varieties of lucerne that you work with in Australia have a dormancy rating of 3 to 10. So dormant varieties um, here are considered you know a score of about 3 and then you go through to highly winter active types which have a dormancy rating of 8 to 10. I think the main thing probably to think about here with lucerne is that increasing winter activity generally um, decreases persistence. Um, and the other thing to think about too, is if you're in a really winter cold area, so some of the higher elevation tableland areas is, there's often not a lot of point in chasing, the, you know, this is just something that often comes up is people will, will want to select something with high winter activity, trying to get more feed in winter, but they're at quite a high altitude. Now the constraint there to expression of that winter activity is temperature. So if you're in a very winter cold area, the thing's probably not going to grow that well anyway, because once you get below a temperature of about 10 degrees, legume growth really slows down. And once you get below six degrees, it's almost, you know, it's almost just sitting there in a suspended state. So choosing things with very high winter activity, if you're in a very winter cold area, is probably not that much benefit. So moving on to grasses um, and talking here about temperate grasses. Um, there's people far better qualified to talk about tropical grasses than me. Um, so dormancy is really just an escape mechanism and it allows a plant to um, avoid periods of stress. So for temperate grasses, that's generally, you know, in that late spring through to autumn period, whether or not they've got that capacity to slow down their growth or switch off their growth and just kind of sit there again in that kind of suspended state. Um, and escape that moisture stress. So the dormancy rating, again with grasses, is really along a continuum, but there's kind of three categories to think about in that. So there's ones that have obligate dormancy, and that means you get to certain temperatures um, or moisture deficit or day length, uh, those kind of things, and the plant just shuts down. Um, so that would be something like a Casbar Coxfoot. Uh, very highly summer dormant and you know through that dormancy period um, until the temperatures decline to the right level and until moisture levels increase that plant will remain dormant. Then you have ones that sort of have the capacity to regulate their growth a little bit so they can respond to significant rainfall events in summer um, but they'll pull back in growth you know if, if moisture conditions get um, a little bit dicey. And then you have ones that just have no dormancy whatsoever. So, you know, the extroverts of the grass world, I guess they're just gonna try and grow no matter what happens. So generally again here, more dormant um, species or varieties for harsher conditions is the way to think about it. 
So um, again, a table there to, to think about in terms of the tolerances of these things to um, soil pH, to water logging, what kind of recruitment potential they have. And we'll talk about that more in the next webinar in, in, um, in terms of how you may have the capacity to manipulate pasture density with these things. So good recruiters, you have a lot of potential for manipulation, whereas ones that don't recruit so well, you've got to rely on an increase in plant size to change um, composition in an established pasture and then drought tolerance as well. So again, um, I won't go into that table in too much detail. It's just something to have a look at and work your way through. So um, I haven't covered chicory and plantains and those sorts of things, um, but you know, while they're very useful plants, um, they're not, I guess, as widespread as, as um, you know, your, your lucens, um, your annual legumes and, and uh, perennial grasses. So in terms of choosing mixtures, um, I guess that's the next thing. So um, I suppose one of the things to think about there is how complex you make the mixture. So there can be a temptation for having quite a complex mix in an attempt to uh, have a good feed supply in a particular paddock throughout the entire year. Um, but there are some difficulties with choosing that. Uh, and one of those is that if you have a very complex mix, then matching herbicides to all of those pasture components, when you get to the stage of wanting to manipulate that pasture or selectively remove uh, weeds that might come up, can be quite difficult in terms of trying to keep all of those particular um, plants in the mix. So you, you'll generally end up compromising something regardless of the herbicide you're going to use because you've got all different tolerances um, when you start to get into highly complex mixes. The other thing too is grazing um, to try and have long-term persistence of that pasture becomes quite difficult um, where you've got quite complex mixtures because uh, you're often needing to graze um, a paddock uh, for you know, one or two species in there uh, to optimise their performance at a time when you maybe should be backing off for some of the other species that are part of that mix. So it can be, become quite difficult to manage those pastures in terms of maintaining balance um, of you know, your grass to legumes or particular legumes or particular grasses within that mix. And the other thing to think about too is um, you've got to think about how vigorous the seedlings are of plants that you put in mixtures. So sometimes if you get to quite complex mixes, you'll have a, a mixture of seedlings that are quite vigorous. So things like ryegrass, um, perennial bromes, they're very vigorous, um, uh, very vigorous seedlings mm -hmm. compared to something like coxfoots and phalaruses and those sorts of things which are you know, quite slow to establish. And you've also got differences with um, underground competition too, in terms of things like lucerne being very hungry for water compared to a shallower rooted or some of the shallower rooted annual legumes where that competition for moisture can impact the capacity of them to produce seed. So just things to think about. So sometimes simple is often better to manage um, for a whole range of reasons. So. Again, it's just sort of thinking about how you optimise your future options. So now around fertilisers um, for, for pasture sowing. Um, and I guess there's been an increasing trend for use of cropping type fertilisers in pasture establishments. So MAP and DAP um, tend to be often the most common um, fertilisers that are used. And they're a good option in one sense because they contain a nice amount of nitrogen and phosphorus, but not much sulfur. And work that we've done over the last six or seven years now, um, sulfur deficiency tends to be very widespread, particularly through the central west. Um, you'll often hear people say, yes, but there's a lot of sulfur at depth. Um, but the thing is, the plants have to actually get their roots down there to pick that up. And deeper testing that we've done, we've not found evidence of sulphur accumulation at this point. And I think one of the things you need to think about there, if there's been a long time since there's been sulphur containing fertilisers put on, um, then if you're not putting it on, it can't move through the soil. So it can't accumulate at depth if it's not going on at all. So just something to keep in mind there. And that's a particularly important thing for legumes is sulfur for, for both um, protein formation within the plant, but also for 
uh, effective nodulation and nitrogen fixation. Um, another another fertilizer that often comes up as use as used in pasture sowings, single super, and again, good on the phosphorus front, um, good on the sulfur front, um, but has no nitrogen. So um, generally, where you, where you can start a type fertilizers or something like um, they're often sold as crop lift or something like that, uh, usually have quite balanced levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Um, for establishing pastures. And the thing to remember is seeds only have seven to 10 days of um, nitrogen supply within the seed to support the plant or the newly emerging seedling. Um, and the other thing is don't forget about molybdenum. So um, there are quite well-defined areas for molybdenum deficiency uh, in New South Wales. It's one of those things though, it's a trace element. Um, it doesn't mean that more is better. If you have too much or you apply too much, um, you can run into issues with copper deficiency in animals. So generally, if you are in one of those deficient areas, um, it's usually about one in four to one in seven years that you need to be uh, looking at applying that so again, soil testing, um, you know, make a smart decision rather than a guess in terms of, of the macronutrients um, that you're wanting to apply. Generally, those soil tests aren't good indicators for trace elements. Um, so tissue tests are more sensitive in, in that case. Uh, and remember that there's no production benefit where you apply nutrients above the critical level. So um, a lot of paddocks that we've seen in the last um, six or seven years in the survey work that we've done uh, have luxury levels of phosphorus available for pastures. There's no extra benefit in um, going above those levels. In a lot of cases, it's, you know, it's up to two times the critical level. Um, so, you know, at that point, perhaps start to look at what the next limiting factor might be and whether that is a nutrient issue or whether it's a pH issue or something like that. So definitely, um, yeah, soil test to make some decisions on what you're going to do with um, those paddocks. Okay. And now on to sowing rates. So thinking back to um, one of those first slides I had up on weed seed banks and We'll have a look at the bottom point on this slide first because you always start with the last point first, clearly. Um, but what we what we saw on that was you were looking at broadleaf weed seed banks of somewhere between 400 and, and around 1,000 seeds per square metre typically um, in pastures, depending on what kind of cleanup strategy had gone into them. And then you'd also have annual grass um, competition there again, which is somewhere in the vicinity of 600 to 6,000 um, plants per square metre. Now, hopefully you're on the bottom end of those of the range for both of those. But if we start to look at some of the typical sowing rates that we see for pasture components, so often with subclover, it's sown at around about four kilos per hectare. When you work that out, that comes out at about now they do differ in seed size between varieties, but let's just look at it on a typical basis. That comes out at around about 48 seeds per square metre. If you were putting phalaris in that mix as well, uh, three kilos of phalaris, you've got about 195 seeds per square metre. So let's say 250 seeds per square metre of what you want to grow compared to a best case scenario of around about a thousand seeds that you don't want to grow. So, um, you know, this is where you can start to look at manipulation strategies and up in seeding rates and that sort of thing to increase competition. And I know sometimes that can seem to be a hard thing to do um, when you look at the price of seed, but in the scheme of things, in the whole cost of pasture renovation, um, you have to consider what that extra kilo or two might mean. And, and really it's a it's a small component of the overall cost of pasture establishment to go to a slightly higher rate. So sowing time um, is a big deal. Um, it is as important as rate and arguably more important than rate. So annual legumes um, need to sow them in autumn if you're talking about scarified seed and preferably early in autumn. Now with some of the newer legumes, they have quite vigorous um, root systems that establish quite quickly and you have capacity to go earlier than you would with a subclover or medic where those seedlings are a bit more susceptible to false breaks. 
Now, once you start to get into winter, it becomes very cold. Now, um, uh, pasture seeds are capable of germinating at very low temperatures, but the thing that happens is you increase the time for emergence. So they're slower to get up and away, they're more susceptible to competition um, from weeds that emerge from the seed bank. Don't take annual legumes into spring. There's not enough time for them to set seed. A lot of them often have vernalisation requirements or day length requirements that they need to hit um, in order to commence reproductive growth. And if you take them, if you sow them in spring, um, they don't achieve those, those goals um, and won't set seed. The perennial grasses and loosen, autumn sowing um, is an option and autumn sowing I mean, is a must if you're looking at putting an annual legume in with that loosen. Um, late winter and spring is a consideration if it's if it's just a grass or it's just a loosen. Um, but you need to think about the annual companion legume. So, um, if I had a dollar for every time I was asked the question of, around, I've got an existing perennial grass pasture or an existing loosen pasture, and I want to introduce an annual legume into it. If I had a good solution for that, um, I may not be sitting here talking to you today. It's one of the hardest things to do because of that outright competition for moisture from the established perennial. Now, pastures containing um, perennial grasses, this is something to keep in mind, will tend to run towards grass dominance over time, regardless of what you do. And that's partly because of the feeding mechanism of the um, legumes in providing nitrogen for those grasses that increases their competitive ability over time. So again, that comes back to the kind of sowing rate that you choose. One of the most susceptible components of the pasture in terms of maintaining pasture balance over time is the annual legume component. So you need to give some thought to stacking the odds. It's a numbers game at the end of the day. Uh, and so the more you can get in up front, the longer you can prolong the inevitable in terms of grass dominance. So again, just something to think about. So having a closer look at sowing time and rate, um, this was some work done quite a while ago now, but um, still still good, valuable information. And this is looking for subclover at an April, May or June sowing um, and looking at what effect that has on seed yield um, that is in the top left. And you can see there that when you delay sowing, um, you have quite a dramatic effect on the amount of seed that's produced. And that speaks to the capacity of that pasture to um, you know, supply or, or have capacity to regenerate uh, going forward reliably. So the more seed you can have in the seed bank, the greater the chance of having seedlings germinate and be successful in establishing and contributing nitrogen to drive production um, of other pasture components. Um, and the other, the, the other graph on the bottom right is looking at the effect of um, sowing rate. So remember a few slides back, I said a really typical sowing rate for subclovers is around about four kilos per hectare, and it's moved back over time. So when this work was done, some of those sowing rates of around eight to 10 kilos were far more common um, in, in pastures that contained annual legumes. But even there, when you're looking at eight, 16, 24, now not that you go to 24, you go broke, uh, in terms of buying that seed, you can see the impact that that has. Now, if you have four kilos there, well, you'll see some four kilo sowing rates later on in some of the work that I show you, but it is all a numbers game at the end of the day in terms of building that seed bank and having capacity for regeneration. So you can see here some of the impacts of um, later sowing um, on on both herbage biomass and on seed production. So this was some work um, of mine at Greenthorpe a few years ago. And on the left, you've got um, subclover that was sown in April, uh, and on the right, subclover that was sown um, four weeks later in May. And you can see the big impact that's had in terms of seed production. And keeping in mind that you've got a target of around a minimum of 150 kilos of seed produced per hectare to have reliable ongoing regeneration um, with subclover. And you can see it's not exclusive to subclover. This is French serradella, um, and it's the same kind of trend that you see there. So big differences in biomass production by the time you get to um, 
mid to late September, but then translate later in the season to, to quite significant differences in seed production. Uh, the other thing here is looking again at that indeterminate growth. So this was um, 2015 at Tomorrow, which was quite a dry spring. Um, in early spring, it looked as though everything had stopped. So we went out and did some um, seed yields. Uh, and that is in the in the first column. Um, you can see the early spring, um, the amount of seed that was there per square metre for the different species that were sown. Then we got some rain, I think it was late October. Uh, and by Cerula being indeterminate, kicked again and went into another round of seed production. So you can see there in that final column, the impact that that capacity for indeterminate growth has on how much seed that different species are able to produce. And again, it's all about building that seed bank and having capacity for regeneration. If we look at the effect of sowing time on seed size, um, this is again, um, the work from Greenthorpe, having a look at um, that. And you can see there with uh, an early sowing, if we rate those at 100, um, then pulling back um, and sowing later, uh, a month later, had a big impact on seed size. And that impacts the, um, again, if you've got small seeds and not very many seeds because you've sown late, then that has an impact on, on the kind of regeneration that you can get. So in terms of sowing time, again, affects rooting depth. So earlier sown ones have capacity to get their roots down much further. So in this one, we've got summer sow compared to the conventional sow, which is the NS on this. So summer sow, um, windows closed for that now, obviously, uh, in late February compared to um, a conventional sowing in May and just looking at maximum rooting depth achieved by those species. So again, the more root system that they can put on, the better they're able to actually um, uh, harvest moisture and nutrients and produce seed. So sowing techniques, important too. So you're really looking at two options at this time of the year, either standalone sowing or under sowing or cover cropping, whatever you want to call it. And both of those have an impact again on seed production. So this is looking again at some work um, from a few years ago. Um, and you can see there with the blue bars for three of the species, uh, you're looking at um, for Vicerula and bladder clover, where you sow them standalone, somewhere between five and 650 kilos of seed produced per hectare. Um, Subclover didn't reach that minimum of 150 kilos of seed per hectare, even with a standalone sowing. But you can see for all of those species, when you go to under sowing them, um, it has quite an impact on, on the amount of seed that's produced and you're not necessarily hitting those targets that you want for ongoing regeneration. And again, that impacts seed size. So with under sown ones, you, you're going to compromise the amount of seed that's produced or and you're also going to affect um, seed size. Now, sowing depth is also important. Most of the seed that you're going to work with is quite small. Um, and if you go to sowing depth greater than one centimetre, that can result in significant reductions in the kind of emergence that you see. So shallow is better and you're far better when you finish sowing to actually see some seed on the surface than not see any seed at all. So legume inoculation, um, Wendy's giving me a hurry up, so we'll move through these. Um, critically important to, uh, to their capacity to fix nitrogen. So the thing to remember here is with the, the host plant generally has a much higher tolerance um, to acidity than does the rhizobia that's required for it to fix nitrogen. So you can see there with subclover, the plant's quite happy down to a pH of about 4.8, but the rhizobia needs a pH of five and a half or above um, to be able to function well and, and support nitrogen fixation. And I think the one that often shocks people is if you look down the bottom for lucin and annual medics, the lucin is quite happy, the plant, at a pH of around five, but for optimum performance of the rhizobia, you need a pH of above seven. So if they're not fixing their own nitrogen, then they're going to be using it from the soil pool and taking it away from other pasture components. Um, that are there. So again, this is all in the setup in thinking about what species you choose. 
or what capacity you have to change pH if there's something else you want to grow. So in terms of improving life for rhizobia, this is again work done quite a while ago. This is looking at the number of nodules per gram of root um, at a pH of around four on the first bar compared to a pH of around five and a half. And you can see a significant increase in the number of nodules produced, so greater capacity to fix nitrogen um, and supply nitrogen to other um, pasture components. And this is, a, again, another one just looking at the proportion of nitrogen in the legume plant that's derived from the atmosphere under different soil pHs. So the plant can either obtain nitrogen from the soil pool or it can fix it itself. And for a legume, you want it to be fixing most of the nitrogen itself to optimise what's available for other pasture components. So you can see there at a pH of 4.8, this was the subclover, about 45% of the nitrogen in the plant was derived from the atmosphere, change the pH to 5.1 and you're up over 70%. So big efficiency gains there. Inoculation technique is something that you need to think about. So peats deliver super high numbers of um, rhizobia to the soil, um, but it's in quite a delicate form for want of a better word where it's prone to desiccation. So going into moist soils with peats is really um, optimal, uh, but they can desiccate very quickly when they're in, um, in dry soil. You move to something like um, some of the granules that are around. So for, as an example in this, the clay-based granules, they have lower numbers of rhizobia, but they're more stable over time. So they're more protected um, and will suit sowing into drier soils. So a thing to think about too is how long um, do inoculants last? And this is an example with a peat inoculant, um, looking at basically a 24 hour time lapse uh, and what happens to um, rhizobia numbers in that inoculation process. Now this is for lupins, so a little bit different, but the principle remains the same. So if we look at the right hand column in that table and look at the percentages, so basically what this is is, you open the bag to begin your inoculation process and you have 100% of whatever's in the bag. Um, with lupins, by the time you um, mix them and stick it in a truck to take it out into the paddock, perhaps an hour's elapsed and you're down to 10% of what you started with. By the time you actually um, sow the thing, uh, and in this case, around about five hours it elapsed, you're down to less than 1% of the number of rhizobia that you started with. So Nothing wrong with peat, but remember that you've got to be quick and you've got to be going into soil with some moisture to have chance, a good chance of survival and good chances for um, formation of nodules and nitrogen fixation if you're going that way. Absolutely nothing wrong with peat, but it's about the timeliness and the condition, soil conditions that you're going into in terms of how long it survives. But get it right and the benefits are um, huge. So this is uh, at Beckham um, down near Ardlethan. This was in Bicerula. Uh, and you can see there in the, in the paddock photo on the left hand side is where inoculation worked. And on the right hand side is where um, um, the producer ran out of inoculant in sowing that paddock. And the photo on the very left of your screen of the Bicerula, um, that's the root system on the inoculated side. So um, yeah, makes a big difference in terms of vigor of that pasture, but also in terms of the amount of nitrogen that's fixed, whether that be for other pasture components or for a crop that you're gonna run over the top of that. Um, we've already done that, so we can move on from that. We won't worry about those for today. Last thing I wanna talk about is um, chemicals. Uh, so herbicides and impacts that they can have. So last thing to think about if you're, if you're going to be um, sowing pastures this year, just check what you've used in the last couple of years in terms of herbicides and what kind of plant backs that you might have. So people are generally very good at observing time periods um, in terms of herbicides but, and, and when it's safe to plant back, um, but there's a lot in the fine print as well. So if we look at this one, which is for dicamba, which you'll often see used um, prior to sowing of pastures for some of those harder to kill broadleaf weeds. Um, down the bottom uh, in the table, there's definitely a time period there, depending on the rate of herbicide you've used. 
but in the fine print up the top, it says you need at least 15 mils of rain um, prior to the plant bacteria beginning. So for example, if you'd use, you're gonna sow a clover or a medic and you'd use 200 mils per hectare, it says it takes seven days. But if you haven't had 15 mils in that seven day period or prior to that seven day period, or since you've applied it, then you haven't started the plant back period yet. So you have to get 15 mils, then you have to wait seven days. So something to think about. Um, Mets off your own methyl. So a lot of that probably went out over summer um, in fallow sprays and that kind of thing. Um, and again, the, the devil is in the detail with these. So it has a soil pH requirement. So the higher the pH gets, the longer that herbicide hangs around, it has a rate requirement. So the more you've used, the longer it takes. It has a moisture requirement in terms of how much rainfall you've had to, um, to have received. And then it also has that time requirement for breakdown. So again, have a look at all of those things, read the fine print on the labels because it's very easy to do everything else right and get tripped up by this. And that is again, the, the kind of effect that you can have. So on the very right of that screen, um, is for trisulfuron, um, the effect that, that residues can have on root growth, um, nodulation and above ground growth. So on the very right, you've got a control that hasn't been exposed to any residue whatsoever. And then as you move across, um, you've got increasing rates of residue present. Now, I think the interesting thing with that slide is the second one from the right, that is one one hundred thousandth of the original application rate that that plant's been exposed to. And it looks quite good above ground and the root system actually doesn't look too bad, but you can see that there's no nodules on that plant at that stage at 14 days so or at 18 days. So can have um, a quite big impact. And the very last thing, if you've got them in the ground already uh, and you're thinking about um, herbicide options for some of the weeds that are coming through, um, you know, and I'm not saying don't spray the weeds because you need to spray the weeds, but thinking about some of the options that you might um, use there and what impact that might have on the legume. So this is some work that we did last year where we were looking at the effect of a range of different post-emergent herbicides on, um, we had about eight or 10 um, legume species in. So I've just pulled a couple out here. The blue bars are no different to the unsprayed control in terms of nodulation, whereas the orangey yellow ones have had a significant reduction in nodulation. So that's for arrow leaf. If we go to yellow serradella, it's a different effect. The different herbicides have had a different impact. So you can see the comparison there between the arrow leaf and the yellow serradella. And then we look at bicerula and again, different, different um, kind of tolerance to different herbicides. So again, it's not that you don't spray those weeds that are a problem, but choose the softest option that you can. And some of these um, are gonna have significant effects uh, above ground as well. So we've got that data to go with it too, but just something to keep in mind in terms of just again, making um, some smart choices. So I'll pull up there, but you know, in summary, I think it's just a case of just getting your ducks in a row in terms of looking at what kind of particularly what what the weed spectrum is in any paddock that you're thinking of sowing um, and getting your head around the, the limitations that you that you might have in those paddocks and what the capacity is to change them and then just select pastures that select pasture mixes or pasture options that give you the most capacity for manipulation going forward and that'll enhance their longer term persistence so I'll pull up there Wendy Thanks very much, Belinda. That was a very, very insightful and jam-packed presentation. Um, I think for our audience today to absorb that there's some great messages right across, right from that early sowing decisions, right through to even treating those those troublesome weeds as we sort of head uh, just out of that into sort of mid-season decisions around around those what's the softest option and, and that work that you've done there in comparing those different chemical types I think is um, is some really interesting work. So we we are at the um, at the one o'clock mark. I'm conscious uh, of people's time, but Belinda has kindly offered to answer any questions that uh, the audience today has about um, about any of the topics that she's covered. So we uh, we will stay on and look um, uh, appreciate people's time. If you'd like to um, if you'd like to 
send any questions now, please do so. Um, I've got some great questions already coming through from today's audience, so thank you for that. While we wait for a few more to come in, um, at the end of this webinar, we will have a quick five question survey uh, for you as the audience to give Belinda and myself a bit of a uh, feedback around what you thought of today's presentation, content and topic. And uh, we really appreciate th that uh, that information. It really helps us deliver events and also uh, deliver something that, that is of value to yourself and also your businesses. So um, I thank you in advance for completing those uh, surveys. So we'll jump into the questions, um, Belinda. So what we've got, the first question is from Mark. Um, can you explain, I know you talked about nodulation, but can you explain for somebody that's establishing a new pasture in this first year, what's the best time in a season to go and actually look for whether their pastures are properly nodulating? Is it sort of more spring or, or what's what's the best time to do that? Yeah, so it depends a little bit on um, when you've sown the pasture and what the growing conditions have been. Now, generally, um, what we do for pastures that are sown in April or May, we'll be looking at, you know, around mid-August to have a look at nodulation. To, and that's that's for sort of definitive quantification of, of what kind of nodulation that you've got. So you can go earlier than that, but you really want um, you really want eight weeks growth on them before or eight weeks after they've emerged um, to be getting a good indication of what you've got there. But usually sort of eight to 12 weeks um, is where we look at them and sometimes we push them out to 12 for some of our research stuff because that's when you've kind of got um, to some extent the, you know, the, yeah, the, the most nodules you're going to have on it in terms of how effective they're going to be for the season. So, yeah, that that would be a um, minimum of eight weeks um, and potentially a little bit longer depending on, you know, if it's been quite cold or if you're in a, if you're in a, a, a quite cold area. Yeah, great. Okay. And um, another question that's come in is, um, what does the seed coding do for the seed numbers that you referred to earlier in your talk? The seed coating. Um, not sure what you mean there, Wendy, but. Um, I'm wondering whether, um, whether does the seed coating, in terms of the question that's been sent in, does maybe the seed coating um, have much of an impact in terms of the number of seeds? Like, should there be a greater portion of coating uh, with the increasing okay. seed rate? Or maybe yeah, that's so angle. If, yeah, if it's yeah. not, please so, um, please let us know and send send a clarification in. Um, yeah, David, for that question. Yeah, so I think um, it depends what the context of the seed coating is, because things like um, say you know like tropical grasses, you have some seed coating on those to help with flowability, um, for you know to make them practical options for sowing. Uh, with legumes, often they come as pre coated um, with you know and pre inoculated seed. Now. Um, you'll, you know, that there are, I suppose, one of the things you need to think about is effective sowing rates. So the seed coat, um, depending on, you know, it, it can vary between manufacturers and between batches in terms of how much of the, the bag that you buy is seed and how much is seed coat. Um, so you do want to adjust your sowing rates for that to achieve the same kind of um, densities. So yeah, it, it is a good thing to be mindful of in terms of thinking about the kind of density you want to achieve, uh, and the you know the yeah what what rate you need to sow. Right. Okay. Not a worry. Thank you for that. And um, as I said, David, if if that hasn't quite answered or, or taken your question in a different um, different pathway, please please um, certainly let me know. Um, so our next question is um, in terms of we're currently sitting in a slight dry period at the moment and, and we've got a number of producers interested in your thoughts around dry sowing. Should um, should people be really making decisions around trying to increase their sowing rate because it is a bit drier at the moment in that topsoil where they're going to be looking at placing their seed? Mm. Um, look, I think sometimes people worry a lot about sowing rates in terms of going too high. But the thing to keep in mind in in a in a good regenerating seed bank, you'll often have 
somewhere between three and more than 500 kilos of of seed there that's capable of germination in terms of like the legume component of that if you've got a really good healthy seed bank so yeah you know there's to me there's never really a great deal of harm in increasing seeding rates um, because and particularly the later you go you've, you've probably got to start to hedge your bets a little bit that way because as the temperatures drop they're going to be slower to emerge you start to get things like red legs then starting to come into it too. So the sort of greater potential for losses, the later, the later that you sow. Um, so there's no harm in increasing it and don't be afraid of it in terms of that competition angle because when you think about, you know, what they do once you've actually got a seed bank there, um, the rates that we use are, are nowhere near the kind of competition that they face when they're coming up in a regenerating um, seed bank. Okay, not a worry. That's a great, uh, great bit of information there. So, in terms of um, the next question, so I've just, um, in terms of fertilizer placement with the seed and the effect on the rhizobia populations, is there is there a more ideal um, depth of where where producers should be really aiming to put their fertilizer versus their seed to ensure that there isn't a sort of a, an effect that that is occurring in uh, in that process of establishing and getting the right environment for their rhizobia as well and having an impact there? Oh, look, it can. The, the, the bigger impact is, um, really the bigger impact comes is if there's contact, you know, prolonged contact in the seed box. And that doesn't generally happen because usually the seed's coming out of a different seed box to the fertiliser. So it's where you have that kind of direct contact for long periods that you'll have, you know, potentially have larger effects on rhizobial survival. Um, there'll be some spatial distancing of them within the row, even if they're delivered within, you know, if they're, if they're delivered in close proximity within the sowing row, there's usually enough spatial separation of them for that not to be a big issue. But, I mean, you can, you can look at... Um, at sort of you know splitting them um, if you want to, but generally you know it's not it's it's not the biggest it's not the biggest issue. So you know it's it's something that you can look at, but the bigger issue comes if you if you were think you know if you're in a situation which doesn't happen very often, where you've actually got contact between the fertilizer and the seed in the sowing box for a prolonged prolonged period. So yeah, that's yeah. the best best of those. Yeah, I'm beating around the bush here, but <laughs> but if you've got separation at sowing in terms of in in the sowing equipment that you're using, so they're coming out of different boxes, you're not going to have too much effect generally. Yeah, I, uh, no, that's great. I think the uh, the question yeah was more um, definitely aimed at if if it has you don't have that option of separation. So yeah. um, that's just great to clarify that it is is about that length of time in um, in that that contact during that during that seeding time so to um, to when it's actually planted. So um, just we'll wrap up with one more question, um, Belinda, I'm conscious of, of the time and uh, producers' time. So we'll, just in terms of seed germinations tests is another question that's come through. Do you recommend for all seed that's been stored, um, you know, from one season to the next to, like, is it essential to always and recommended to get a um, germination test for, for that seed regularly or or sort of what's what's the views on on seed germination tests for any anybody that's sort of got a bit of old seed still in their um, in their back shed so yeah look I, I think it's it's such cheap insurance to do that to just yeah. you know it's because it is it, it is just I know I've said it a lot today but it's it is just a numbers game so it's a you know yeah it's a, it's a very cheap insurance option just to check the viability of that seed. Yeah, great. Okay, not a worry. I think um, I think we'll pull that that up there, and I thank uh, all the audience for sending in some questions. Well, um, if you'd like to contact Linda at all and discuss any part of today's today's presentation, you can. Um, Linda's contacts are on screen now. Have you registered for the next webinar with myself and Belinda next week? Um, so we'll be focusing, as Belinda said, on talking about manipulation of pastures for improving their productivity.
So I hope to see a number of you there and, and we look forward to having you on at that time. Just to bring to everybody's attention, there is also a number of events uh, going on across the Central West region for a number of different uh, workshops, training events or field days and certainly um, a few are listed on your screen now but I'd encourage everybody to go to the Central West Local Land Services event website and, uh, and have a look for those events that may be occurring in your local area. So that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I'd like to thank Belinda for her time today and I also look forward to hosting you at the next annual temperate pasture webinar. So until that time, I say thank you and goodbye.